So this is a, a whole section on perception and vision is one of those perceptions that we need to ha have working for us and we want to have working for us. We want to be able to tell uh, friend from foe and sunflower from not sunflower. I don't know. So we want to be able to tell information from visual and from, from visual cues, from optical cues. But there's a lot that we do with optical cues that is not consciously perceived. And I want to give just a flavor of that in, in a very short uh, video right now. So one is uh, orienting movements. Uh, and these orienting movements, if, if, they're, if something goes flashing by, if a bird were to fly right by, I would have a very hard time not following that bird, not orienting to that bird. Or if there was a very large sound off to my right, I would look to my right. Well, how would I do that? I would use my shoulders, I would use my neck, and I would use my eyes. These are orienting movements. I also may actually turn my whole body. So the orienting movements are, are organized by the superior colliculus, that one of the four hills that, that um, decorates the top of the midbrain. Um, the superior colliculus is going to get in mostly visual information, but also some auditory and somatosensory information. And in return, it's going to say, it's going to dictate how you get to look at that, um, that new stimulus, that exciting, new, moving, unexpected stimulus. And so orienting movements occur. You can follow things that, you, uh, th that, that flash by you. You can orient to sounds. And this is independent of conscious perception. And so that is highlighted by a condition known as blind sight where, it, and it's fairly rare, but if somebody loses cortical sight, so their whole, their eye is working, their cranial nerve two is intact, but they can't see back in the uh, cortex, this is how it typically happens, there's some kind of either trauma or stroke to the, uh, of the occipital cortex, and, um, and now primary visual cortex doesn't work, and so downstream sites that are critical for conscious perception of visual information also don't work. In that situation, the retina sends a separate set of, uh, of axons, not through the lateral geniculate to get to cortex, but directly over to midbrain, to the superior colliculus, which in other animals is known as the tectum. And so, the, uh, so there's a separate and, and phylogenetically conserved ancient projection from the retina to the superior colliculus, and that serves these orienting movements. So a person cannot have any conscious perception of visual images, and yet they may follow a moving visual target with their eyes. Uh, the, the other type of uh, non-perceptual vision uh, function that I want to talk about arises from a very peculiar type of, uh, through, from a very peculiar path that was only discovered around 2000. Uh, what we've learned so far, remember that this is the, the choroid and the pigment epithelium. Here are the outer segments of the photoreceptors. They're, they're married to this pigment epithelium, ne never the twain shall part. Um, uh, so under normal circumstances, all the, the uh, light is absorbed and transduced by these photoreceptors. And in 2000, uh, David Burson and, and others uh, um, realized or, or showed evidence that, in fact, there are a class of these cells in the retinal ganglion cell layer, so retinal ganglion cells, that are intrinsically photosensitive. They have a different uh, mechanism for, for, for phototransduction. Instead of using retinol and rhodopsin or some version of opsin, they use a, um, a molecule called melanopsin, which is used also in invertebrate vision. And this is, this is a self-renewing uh, um, uh, pigment, so it doesn't require going out to another cell type to renew it. It simply, it, is, it, it transduces light, and then it can, it can make itself ready within the same cell 
for another ray, uh, another uh, set of photon absorptions. So these don't need to be next to them, and they are not. These intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are, you know, it's a very, it's a very cool story because it's, it was really unexpected. They, they do two very important, um, they have two very important functions for, that are relevant uh, for, um, for clinical medicine. One is that they support the pupillary light reflex. So the pupillary light re reflex is predominantly supported by information coming from these melanopsin containing intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, often uh, uh, abbreviated as IPRGCs. So these uh, are supporting the pupillary light reflex that we went over when we talked about cranial nerves. You should make sure that you under remember that circuit. Um, and the other thing that it supports is circadian entrainment. In other words, making sure that you sleep uh, during nighttime when there's little light and that you uh, are awake during the daytime when there's light. Uh, and our circadian, our intrinsic circadian clock is, is close to 24 hours, but not quite 24, it's not exactly 24 hours. And so this entrainment is very important to keep us entrained with the, the planet's rotation. Um, if in people that don't have this, it's going to make sleeping much more difficult because one of the things that circadian entrainment does is that it, it, it uh, is linked to hormo hormone release, such as melatonin release, that promotes things such as sleep. So in the absence of these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, there will be no um, sleep-wake cycle uh, or, or no entrainment of that sleep-wake cycle to the night and day. And in, in, in blind people and people without uh, this function, um, people will, they, they, they are helped a lot by giving them exogenous melatonin every night to help them have a circadian rhythm because they cannot entrain on their own. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move from, um, uh, in, into perceptual function. We're going to move out of the retina and move over to uh, cortex. Cortex.